podcast. Even babies are invited. <laughs> okay, great. Uh, John? Yeah, hello. Hello. Uh, she, uh, when it just said that she got sent the link to register, she's already registered. Should you register again? Okay. Yes, anyway, Michaela, Michaela, just go ahead and message her directly. Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Dr. Nguyen. I am a geriatrician with the Department of Geriatric Medicine at JAPSM, and I'm the course director for this Care Homes Echo series. And our purpose is to help you deliver the best care for our kapuna living in our care homes and foster family homes. Uh, next slide. So you were probably wondering, what is ECHO? So ECHO is a model of online education that started in New Mexico. And ECHO stands for Extension for Community Health Outcomes. So these are not just lectures. This is a forum where we, which includes you and everybody joining us online, can learn from experts and from each other's experiences and provide a safe place to ask questions about what you see every day. So the ECHO model is, you know, all teach, all learn. So this is our opportunity to create a little community here, a community of learning. And as you can see on this slide, other benefits of this ECHO model is that it's free, it's convenient, you don't have to leave your home or your clients, and you get free continuing education. Right, and a little bit about the format. After a short lecture from our experts, we will share expertise from the rest of the team here and open up for a time of case discussions. So we invite you to share your questions or your cases, and it might not <coughs> even be on a topic related to today's lecture. Just the idea is, you know, this is an open place of, of uh, sharing and learning and uh, sharing our collective wisdom together. Next slide. So, um, so ground rule number one is we must keep patient confidentiality. This is what we call HIPAA compliance, right? So no personal identifying information. Uh, ground rule number two is that this is a safe place to learn and share. And uh, also important to note that this is not an official doctor's consultation visit. The purpose for this series is to become a forum for learning and sharing. Okay, next slide. So some of the Zoom logistics, if you haven't been on Zoom already, welcome and glad you can try us out here. But on the bottom of your screen on the left side, there is a chat tool, right? And uh, you can, if you enter your name and your organization, we can say hi to you and know who you are. And that will be great our way of getting to you. And then um, there's also a mute button on the bottom side, which if you click on it, um, will mute uh, and unmute. And so of course, uh, we want you to unmute uh, when you're speaking and mute when you're not speaking so we don't hear all this background noise. So yeah, no, and I see people uh, clicking in and typing in who they are. And that is fantastic. We like to know who you are so we can address you as well. Uh, so everybody give it a try. I see only 18 people have put in the chat box. Come on. Oh, we have folks from Hilo, from Maui. We have service coordinators. We have um, folks all over the island. This is fantastic. So glad that you can join. Okay. And um, next slide. So this is our schedule. We're gonna be going on the third Thursday of each month. And so uh, today is April the 15th and we're gonna be doing monitoring patients for COVID-19. Next slide. So um, just a little bit about continuing education credits. Um, so doctors who join us can get their CME credits. It's also sponsored by the HCCME. 
nurses can um, claim their CE credits. Social workers can also get their um, social work credits from the National Association of Social Workers and care home operators can get the required certificates of attendance. So yeah, free CEs for everyone. But um, as a reminder, um, you have to complete a um, evaluation form in order to, to receive the, the certificates of attendance or CEs. And evaluations can be found in our website under the evaluations tab or at towards the end of the, um, the talk of the hour, we'll put in a link where you can just click on it right away and you can complete the evaluation right after the session. So then you won't forget. Yeah, so yeah. Oh, I noticed that somebody from Guam joined us as well. And that's super exciting. We got people all over the place from every island. This is fantastic. Okay, next slide. So I'm gonna introduce, this is our hub team. That's me over there. Um, and then we also have one net, one net Gaylord, you wanna wave hello to everybody. She's the president of the Alliance of Residential Care Administrators. Thank you for joining us. Aloha and mahalo for having me. Yes, and we have Maribel Tan. You wanna wave hi? Maribel is the president of the Adult Foster Home Association of Hawaii. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I, I see a lot of our members, so thank you. And um, let's all learn together. Mm, thank you. Great. And we have Shane Anderson, who is from United Healthcare, service coordinator manager. You can uh, wave hello to everybody. Aloha. Great. And we have Juliana Caldwell from Aloha Care, also a service coordinator manager. And you can wave hello. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Great. Great. So let's see. So then we also have, um, so anyway, I see lots of you now. We have like 51 people have uh, put in the chat box. Oh, all over the place. This is fantastic. So you're introducing yourself in the chat box. And if you have other people in the room with you, you can also add your name into their, I mean, those people's names in the chat box as well. So if they're sharing the same screen and, you know, like three people are watching one screen, put in their names in the chat box. So we can get everybody and everybody can, you know, get credit for being part of, part of this, this, uh, this great event. Okay. Okay. So uh, next slide. Okay, so uh, today's speakers, well, I guess I'm going to start off with myself today. I, I will start the sessions off. I'll be speaking, but we also have Audrey Suga Nakagawa. She is the advocacy, advocacy director at AARP Hawaii. You want to say hello, Audrey? Hello, everybody. Thank you for having me today. Okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Um, so, uh, John, can we pull up the the presentation slides and we can get going while everybody's still putting in their chat box. This is great. Oh, all these alohas from everywhere, all over the place. This is fantastic. Okay. So keep those chats coming in. It's great get practice doing that so that you can actually chat questions into the chat box while I'm talking and then we can address them as you go along. So don't be shy. Okay, so monitoring patients for COVID-19. Next slide. Oh. You need to turn on. John, can you move in person? Hi, okay. I'm back. Okay. So yeah, so a little bit about COVID-19, the virus spread, how does it work? So basically exposure can occur 48 hours before feeling sick, right? And so uh, when you feel sick, it's already kind of late, right? The virus has already been incubating inside of you for a couple of days and you're being contagious even before you feel sick. So, and actually the incubation period is two to 14 days after exposure. And, but most people have symptoms by day four or five. And so, some people do not feel sick ever, but they can still feel spread COVID. And that's what we call asymptomatic, right? So people, so we have to be mindful of that. 
And then even and after testing positive for COVID, people need to uh, quarantine for 10 to 14 days because of this incubation period to make sure that they don't spread it. So yeah, because COVID is spread mostly by respiratory droplets. That means from your breathing and coughing and talking and singing, those are the main ways that the COVID-19 virus is spread. A little bit by surfaces, but that's not the main way of spread. Next slide. Yeah, so um, our kapuna are at the highest risk because oftentimes as we get older, our immune system, what we, how we, our bodies fight off infection become weaker. And so sometimes uh, what happens is that uh, the virus kind of multiplies so rapidly and takes over the body can't fight against it and can result in sickness or death. So because our clients are the highest risk, we must be extra careful not to bring it in. They're usually the, not the ones going out and partying, right? It's the people who are working, who are coming into the home in and out, in and out. So that's why we are the ones, we have to be the guards. We have to be extra careful not to bring it in. So part of that is to screen for symptoms every day, make sure that we do all our physical distancing, six feet apart, you know, masks and hand washing a lot, a lot of hand washing. Um, and making sure the masks are fitted correctly, right? And not falling off down the nose uh, or, or, or things like that. Um, next slide. Okay, so what are the, some of the symptoms to look out for? for? So amongst the staff, amongst yourselves, right? We all know what the primary symptoms of it, of COVID um, are. It's usually, it's the fever, it's the cough, it's the muscle aches, right? It's the, the, the respiratory symptoms, it's the shortness of breath, right? Um, some people have sore throat, diarrhea, headache. And, um, and the thing that I really want to also point out is that loss of smell and taste are also quite common in about one third of the people who get this, because this is a virus that gets in through the nose. And for some reason, that's kind of where it attacks and it affects uh, and where it begins to multiply, and that's where it affects the, the smell and the taste. So if you start having that, even if that's your only system, symptom, you have to look out for that. So yeah, so these are you know key symptoms uh, that we have to screen for every day before we come to work. Next slide. But symptoms are different in older adults. So because remember I mentioned before that older adults sometimes don't have a strong and immune system response, they can't fight the infection as well, they may not have a fever. They may not be coughing. They may not have chest tightness, shortness of breath, or sputum that's coughing up uh, mucus, right? The only symptoms they may have is they may have just a faster heartbeat, a faster rate of breathing. They might not say they're short of breath, but if you watch them carefully, they're breathing fast, right? or they might have a low blood pressure, or they might have a poor appetite, poor drinking, and they cannot taste or smell. And, or they may be just confused and tired or sleepy, or just need more help than usual. So they may not present with the classic symptoms of COVID that younger people may have. Next slide. So, yeah, so it just might look like this person over here, right? You put the tray of food there and they just look at it and they just don't feel hungry. So the changes may not be obvious. And so we like to use um, uh, for our aides and folks, uh, some, a tool that we call stop and watch. And so if you notice a change while caring for one of your clients or your residents, you, you know, things like, hmm, they seem different than usual they're talking less, or they just seem to need more help overall than usual, or, you know, they're not participating in activities the way they always do, you know? Maybe they have pain or something is not quite right. Eating less, no bowel movements, or having diarrhea. Sometimes um, GI side effects are common in people with COVID. 
drinking less weight change, that's because they're not eating and drinking, or they're agitated or more nervous or more confused than normal. Um, tired, weak, confused or drowsy, changes in their skin, maybe they feel their skin is cold or something, their circulation is not very good, or they need help with walking or transferring or toileting. So things like that. If you start to notice anything like this, you should be checking, checking a little bit more in depth. Next slide. So what do we check for? Well, hopefully, you know, um, well, actually you first remember it's a respiratory problem. So we should be checking that respiratory rate. Do we know how to check respiratory rate? We get our watch, right? Get a watch and you look at the second hand, right? And you start hit go or your phone, right? And you hit go and you count how many breaths they have in one minute. And if they're breathing more than 20 to 25 breaths per minute, that's not a good sign. That's, that's a bad sign, right? With one minute. And uh, you probably should call your doctor. Or if you happen to have what's a pulse oximetry, um, and you, know, you can buy these at uh, CVS or something like that. And it basically gets your oxygen level from your your fingertip from your fingernail. And so normal oxygen levels are 96 to 100 percent and no cause of concern. But if the oxygen level starts dropping below 92 percent, that's when you really should start getting concerned and think about letting your doctor know. Um, just so you know, these things are not entirely 100 percent ac accurate uh, because uh, in, if people are very dark skinned or if they're very got blue hands or they have dark nail polish, you should always wipe off the nail polish before you check it. Um, it, it may be off a little bit, but if you're in the range of the low 90s, it's, it's a problem already and you should probably uh, start thinking about calling the doctor uh, about that. Next slide. So what else do we monitor? So we should monitor the heart rate as well. Same thing, you look at your watch, get your timer and you count, look at that pulse and count how many they have. And if the heart rate is more than 100 beats per minute, that's not a good sign, right? So we need to let them know. That means the heart is working hard to try to keep up. Also checking that blood pressure. If the blood pressure is less than 90 over 60, um, that means they're not having enough pressure to, to circulate um, everything they need, their brain and everything. So that's the sign of a severe infection actually. And so you should also notify the doctor. What about fever? Now fever is tricky. Most people say, oh, fever, that's a temp of 101.5, which is true in most people. But you know, as I said earlier, sometimes when you get really old, your immune system response is not as robust, not as strong. And if your temp is 100.9, that counts as a fever. And for some others, um, especially if they are always cold, always low, then a temperature rise of only of two degrees, even if it's not above 99, could count as a fever. So just knowing someone's baseline temperature is really important because uh, if they're warmer than usual, two degrees above their baseline, um, that counts as a fever. Yeah, or, and the other one mentioned here is that if the temperature is more than 99 on two consecutive measurements, two in a row, and it's consistently over 99. So yeah, so this is the, um, the thing to, to be watchful for, especially in older patients. Okay, the other thing to look out for is confusion. Like, look for changes in alertness or confusion. Like, they're not usually this confused. What's going on, right? Or somehow they're just, why is this person like dozing off after breakfast? They usually don't do that. You know, why are they um, wanting to go back to bed early or they're not getting up in the morning, right? Something is amiss. They're a little confused or sleepy. And then of course, that monitoring, that eating and drinking is really crucial because as we said, it can affect your taste and your smell. Um, and that might be the first sign is not eating and drinking, right? And we wanna catch this early. Next slide. 
Okay, so for the nurses on the call, right, confusion can mean what we call delirium. And what delirium is, is basically if you start seeing this, this group of symptoms together, which is acute onset, which means that this is new, this suddenly happened, this wasn't, this hasn't been a problem for a week or two, this is new in the past two days, something new has changed. Uh, inattention, they can't pay attention to you suddenly. They have trouble answering questions. It's not just dementia, it's like they can't focus. If they're disorganized thinking, which means like they're having hallucinations and paranoid and things like that, thinking things aren't there, seeing things that aren't there, hearing things that aren't there, things like that, um, that's different than usual. That's disorganized thinking. And then altered consciousness. That means a change in the weather alertness, whether just sleeping during the day and awake at night. And if you start to see these kinds of things, um, they need medical help right away. This is what they, this is this, this, this uh, acronym AIDA for a delirium is, is the CAM, the confusion assessment method. So they have a met, this means they may have a medical illness and should be evaluated by a doctor. Next slide. Okay, so how do you call it? So you have to call the doctor, right? So if you need, um, if you're, you know, you saw those vital signs and the blood pressure is low, the heart rate's kind of fast and fever is a little high, right? You need to call that doctor. And so we suggest using a standardized process of communication called SBAR, which stands for Situation, Background, Assessment, and Request. So next slide. Yeah, so before calling the doctor, you know, we really need to make sure we collect all the information from all the different staff about anything that they've noticed has changed. So such as the stop and watch. So all, everybody, all the caregivers can have the stop and watch thing and evaluate each resident uh, with the stop and watch and, you know, get different people's point of view, not just one. That would be really helpful. Next slide. And before calling the doctor, you should gather the SBAR information. So make sure you have all the vital signs and you, view, you have that medical record, you know, make sure they, you know what their code status is, what allergies, what their medications are and any recent medication changes and, uh, and anything else that might be pertinent. Uh, so yeah, just have all the information next to you. Next slide. Right, so what might the doctor order um, if you call them, right? Well, common problems with these changes, you know, uh, that we mentioned before, it might be medication side effects that might be happening, or they might have an infection, which is why we want to get to that right away. They may want to check some labs uh, and um, maybe even a COVID swab, right? If they're concerned about COVID. Um, and, you know, they may ask about different other medical illnesses that may, they may have that, that could be happening. You know, if they have history of seizures or strokes or surgery or history of dehydration in the past, things like that. Um, um, so, yeah, so, um, so if that's the case, then, um, then, the do then the doctor will, you know, ask you all these things and then make a recommendation for you to, to follow. And you know that recommendation may include doing COVID testing. Um, so um, I'm gonna, um, actually I'm gonna have um, Audrey talk a little bit about like, if you're concerned somebody has COVID, um, we, there is a book, uh, Hawaii Department of Health has guidelines and protocols. Audrey, can you share? Yes, I do. Thank you, Dr. Wen. So, uh, about in February, you should have all received a copy, an electronic copy of this residential care home and foster firm COVID-19 guidelines and protocols. And this provides you with some very simple, um, easy to follow step-by-step -step, uh, information that will help guide you to find the resources and how to 
uh, go through the process of determining and mitigating the COVID-19 infection should it happen in your home or with your residents. Now, I know that when the pandemic broke out last year, you were all getting inundated with information from CDC and Department of Health. And there was so much information come left and right. And it, of course, it was evolving as we learned more and more about COVID-19. And so there was a, a uh, a, a cry out, not a cry out, but for, you know, a request that, you know, is there something that could be very simplified, easy to follow, especially for the care homes, because a lot of this information was designed more for the larger nursing homes and for the hospitals. And so what we had done, because the Department of Health had really been overwhelmed with a lot of information, a team of interdisciplinary uh, professionals, uh, there were representatives from the uh, Department of Human Services, the Ombudsman. Ombudsman, Dr. Wen, Dr. Yazawa, um, health, retired healthcare administrators, public health nurses, they came together and we put together a work group to develop this protocol for you. And so I hope you all have a copy of this. It was designed easy for you to print out. And then if you could put it in a three ring binder, that would be, you know, really easy, It'd be like a cookbook and just go through it really quickly. Next slide, please. So the basic information you find in the guidelines it talks about advanced directives for COVID. So a lot of this is really good information that you should have had from before, but maybe you never did. Talked about disinfecting transportation, you know, which transportation companies are willing to transport somebody who is COVID positive because a lot of companies are not doing it or are not allowing it. Who to notify, what is some of the basic infection control, screening and testing. So all of this information is available in this particular uh, manual. So I, again, I hope you all had a chance to look at it, printed it out, put it in a three ring binder and use that as your um, easy to easy reference material. So, and I wanted to really thank all those individuals who helped put to put this together because um, you know, it really took us a while to go through all the different protocols and make sure that it's something that's applicable for your operations. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you. Yeah, and also I know that Michaela just put into the chat box a link uh, that you can find, um, you can download this uh, guidebook. So yeah. You can, if you don't already have it, you can get an electronic copy and save it as well. And you can take a look at it. Great. Okay, next slide. Okay. Oh, I also just want to talk a little bit about COVID testing. And there's a whole section in the book about COVID testing as well. And I just want to just mention that there are basically two main tests. There's that reverse transcriptase, the RT-PCR, which is the gold standard. That is the best way. And it takes a small amount of the virus DNA and multiplies it so it's detectable. So this kind of test may take days. Remember that when you send it out and it takes a few days to come back. It's more expensive, but it's very accurate, more than 90% accurate. And um, especially if the infection is within five days. And we often test a person who is feeling sick. And basically this is a confirmation test. Um, for positive screening tests. So, and this can stay positive for many, many weeks, even after a person gets better. And even if they no longer can give the virus or spread it to anyone. So once, once positive, it can stay positive for, for many, many weeks. The other test that you may have heard about in the community is something called a rapid antigen test or the screening test. And so basically this also kind of uh, looks for pieces of the virus, but you know what, you, you, you do order the test, it's 15 minutes, 15 to 45 minutes, you can get a result right back. And it's very cheap. It's not as, the other one is like hundreds of dollars. And this one is something like $15 or something like that. So it's a big difference, but it's less expensive, but it's also less accurate. And so this is good for screening large groups of people, and especially if people are not necessarily sick, right? So you just want to kind of screen the whole building, the whole facility, that kind of thing. Uh, to see what's what's out there. So that's a screening test. And if it's positive, then you want to go back and order this PCR test to say, okay, now we, we know the PCR is more expensive, but it's more accurate. And we need to know if this person's positive. And that's when you go back to the PCR test. So that's just something you should know about the difference between these two types of tests. And um, there's something else called the antibody testing, which is a blood test. 
Um, but it's not, it's like after you get sick, your body mounts an immune response and, um, so, and produces antibodies. And so sometimes after a person gets sick, they can have antibodies, but it's not useful for diagnosis uh, because um, if they're positive, it could mean that they had asymptomatic infection three months ago and that doesn't help you right now. Yeah, so it doesn't, doesn't uh, necessarily help anything. So, but just so you know um, what's out there. And so hey, what happened- Dr. Wynn, uh, quick question. Yes. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, Dr. Um, Cohen just asked a question in the chat. I thought I would throw you direction because it's related to the testing. Do you have sensitivity and specificity data related to the accuracy? Uh, um, there is a sensitive and specificity. I, you know, I don't have it exactly right here, but I think it's, um, I, I can pull that up for you for the next, uh, next talk, but, um, uh, it's something, uh, the antigen test, I think it, 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 it varies depending on the test and, and actually the PCR too, it varies depending on the test and also varies depending on how well trained a person is and how well they're swabbing uh, the, the nasal passages. If they do a very quick quick swab, they may not get it. But if you go dig in deep inside and you kind of make sure you get a good sample, you know, you're more chances that it's going to be accurate. So there is a range. Um, uh, but there, there have been false positives and false negatives for both. The numbers kind of keep changing. So I can try to get you the most recent ones uh, the next time, but yeah. It is not as accurate. And unfortunately, in, in, in a bunch of our nursing homes, sometimes we have all these things and we have to wind up chasing rabbit holes just to make sure that this is not a false positive or a false negative with these antigen screening tests. Because a lot of facilities, they, they have to do it every, you know, every once a month or every two weeks, depending on the community prevalence of these uh, antigen screening tests. So they're not fail safe, they're not perfect, but at least it gives us a starting point um, and then, of course, you have to confirm it with that gold standard, which is over 90% accurate um, in terms of um, specificity. So if it's positive, it's most likely positive. If it's negative, um, not so sure. Next slide. Okay, so, so what happens if your resident tests positive and their, po their, their test comes back positive, what do you do? Well, you know, I think the obvious thing is if it's severe and they're really, you know, having trouble breathing and their vital signs are out of whack, um, they need to go to the hospital and you don't need to figure out what to do with them, right? Uh, even if they're moderate and they're short of breath and they're low in oxygen or they have a pneumonia or something, you know, their lungs sound really awful, right? They should be going to the hospital. And the hospital will figure out what to do with them. And oftentimes they may need things like, you know, IV medications and steroids and anti-clotting medications and just general supportive care. And that's generally what happens if you have moderate symptoms. If your patient tests positive and is not really sick at all, is either asymptomatic, is tired or weak or eating less, then you should still call your doctor, contact a doctor or a hospital for consideration for IV monoclonal antibodies as an outpatient uh, to prevent worsening. There's not a lot of treatments out there that have been proven to work, but uh, for now, the, for emergency use authorization, um, we currently there's uh, these, you know, like to fight the infection, your body has to make antibodies. Well, they have these, I guess, factory made antibodies. Um, there's these two long, crazy names, which are very difficult to pronounce, but when they're, they're, it's recommended that these two antibody um, cocktails are given together and that can prevent the patient from developing worsening symptoms. And so if they're tired and weak or eating less, that's, they won't get worse than that. So there is utility to try to contact um, the doctor or the hospital for this type of treatment if, if um, something is suspect is positive. So that's what I wanted to say about that. And now I'm just gonna open it up for questions. And so bring it on. 
Um, uh, John, you can turn off the uh, slides and then we could just have everybody on the call. So the, the one question that I see uh, not answered so far in the chat is just regarding how do people get their certificates of attendance, including their SDGs? Okay, so I don't know if Michaela, you're on and you could share. I am on, sorry, share. Um... I repeat it, the baby was yelling at me. What do you want to? Oh yeah, they were wondering how can they get their certificates of attendance? Okay, and sorry, their, yes, yeah, absolutely. SCG. So um, the best way to get your, your certificates of attendance is that you need to um, chat your name into our chat box so that we can take attendance. I know many of you have multiple people um, viewing from one screen. So we just need everybody's names. And then at the end, if you could please fill out an evaluation there's a Google form that I will um, I'll put in here right now. Everybody who has attended and wants a certificate has to fill out this, um, this form. And then we will send on uh, the certificates of attendance or CME or social work CEs as is appropriate. I'll put it in here right now. Okay, great. Okay, great. So yeah, everybody, you keep on chatting in your names for your attendance. That would be fantastic. Yeah. So yeah. So how are your experiences with COVID now these days? Have you have any of your facilities gotten patients with COVID? And were you in touch with Department of Health? How did that? How did they help you? Well, I want to thank the Department of Health because they did afford us with um, quite a bit of PPE that we were able to disperse. Um, ARCA was able to distribute to all of the care homes on the island of Oahu. So I do want to send out a special thank you to the Department of Health and HAIMA for doing that for us. Yeah. Do folks have enough PPE? Um, yes, we uh, receive also from on uh, Department of Health and um, from uh, HAIMA. Thank you and thank you to um, uh, HAIMA and Department of Health. And we distributed to all our members, including the other islands. Great. Yeah. What other? Uh... I think I haven't heard any um, any more um, from uh, the foster homes. Uh, from um, from what I know, um, there's no any there's uh, there's no uh, incident of COVID uh, for the couple months. Mm. Ready. Mm. You know, I, I see in the chat box that some people don't have enough PPE. And somebody else is saying they actually have to reuse their PPE. Oh, well, and if they true. did oh, not receive ahead. their PPEs yet, they have to. Um, because uh, some of our members did not pick up their PPEs yet. So um, they can get in touch to us on where to get their PPEs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hi, this is Juliana from Aloha Care. I wanted to just add to that. Um, we do have PPE go kits that we have um, distributed to designated CCMAs across the islands. And if you guys ever do um, have issues receiving any of those PPE go kits, please reach out um, and we can make sure that you guys have that um, necessary um, um, supplies so you can keep yourself safe as well as um, your members that you're serving. Um, I had another question um, also in regards to um, the members that are, you all are serving. Have you guys noticed any issues with 
um, hesitancy in regards to receiving vaccines um, or your members wanting to receive vaccines or needing additional education in regards to those vaccines? Well, um, I, I was talking to Audrey yesterday and I, we noticed there's a lot of uh, foster homes specifically that uh, did not um, do the, um, the vaccine. And there's still some hesitation. So I think we're gonna have um, the next one, yeah, Dr. Wen, regarding the vaccine. So yeah. I hope um, they will be enlightened and we encourage everyone to uh, uh, take the vaccine because um, I know our clients are mostly at home, but um, us caregivers and our other family member that goes out to the community will be the one who will be um, giving the virus to our clients. So we have to put that in mind. Yeah, actually, so, you know, we don't have all the answers. So, but what we want you to do, if you could chat in your questions and your issues uh, before next month's thing, that we're gonna do our best to find the answers for you. You know, so that's part of the part of the reason for the sharing that we have the opportunity to share. What are your challenges? What are your needs? And then, you know, if we don't know where to get it, we're going to find it for you. And that way you can all be all ready. And, and that's sort of the idea. So, yeah, that the whole question of, yeah, that in-home vaccine, if you missed it and you don't know where to do it again, maybe it's we need to figure that out again. Um, I think the nursing homes have that problem as well. Um, yeah, because at this point, it's like, well, yeah, you have to go out to CVS and, and get it, but that's not, you know, very realistic for, for some of these clients. So. Um, hi, this is Donnelly Williams. Um, thanks, Aloha Care, for speaking up about that PPE. But I think also, um, if you folks contact your CCMAs, um, we have been working with the state, the health plans. And like she said, that some of the CP CCMAs have um, go kits with PPEs in there. So if you contact your CCMAs, they may be able to help get some of that to you. Also, along working with the state for there could be some pharmacies or um, that will come out to your care homes to provide um, the vaccines. Um, that's supposed to be worked out with, um, I think, the CCMAs also, correct? I forgot your name from Aloha Care, but I think yeah. that was was, that's yeah. correct. Yeah, this is Juliana. Um, oh, hi, Juliana. Yeah, <laughs> that's correct. Um, we yeah, do have designated with that. Yeah. And, and yeah, I just wanted to thank all of you caregivers out there for taking care of our members and also number one, ensuring that you folks are safe first. Um, and um, thank you so much for being the frontline workers and taking care of them. Mm -hmm. This is Definitely. Shane from United Healthcare, and I absolutely agree. Uh, thank you all for all of the work you're doing. And I did want to reiterate, um, you can also contact your health plan that you're involved with, the CCMAs are involved with. Uh, for the members, we do have go kits stashed uh, at various locations around the island for rapid deployment. Um, so never hesitate to reach out to uh, anyone you might have as a contact at a health plan that you're working yeah, and, and just a word on PPEs, right? So if you you know you're you don't have any COVID in your facility and and nobody is suspecting, you don't have to wear an N95, right? You you basically a regular surgical face mask um, with plenty of you know hand washing um, is, is 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 sufficient for that. But once you have somebody who you're suspected with a PUI or a person under investigation, that's at the point. That's when you start to wear the PPE, the, the N95 mask, the face shield, the gown and the gloves and, and isolate them right away. So that's the point where you really need to, but so you have to have it ready and available because you never know. Okay, let's see. Somebody else mentioned something that we need gloves as part of the PPE. Do, do, do we not have a supply of gloves? Is that something that people are short on? Um, the ones that they sent to us, we don't have uh, gloves uh, in the one that was uh, given to us by um, Ahima and Department of Okay. 
we're still waiting for that. Um, we're hoping we're gonna get some soon. Okay, so we'll see if we can make sure gloves are in there, yeah? And um, I was talking to Audrey yesterday, Dr. Ren, with the, um, there was a question with some of our um, clients um, who are bed bound that um, went to the hospitals or um, was in their dialysis or um, they weren't home when um, the uh, people from the pharmacy came into our homes to do the vaccine. So they weren't able to get one. And I know there's a lot of um, questions if they're gonna have somebody come in and do them for their vaccines. Yeah. Yeah, this sounds like a common problem and we're gonna have to go see, talk to Hayima and see what they, they can find another solution or the other health uh, or the um, the pharmacies again, I think we need to to keep working on them for a, a ongoing plan, not just a one-time plan, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I noticed here's a question about um, a bunch of clients who refuse vaccines due to a lot of things on the media that are not very reassuring. So we have to deal with families who are not getting vaccinated and insist on coming to visit. So. We're gonna to try to tackle that one next month. We're gonna talk about vaccines and vaccine hesitancy and maybe education about what the vaccine is and, and the problems with the side effects uh, of the vaccine. But I'll, I'll just have to say that just, um, uh, just to say that um, the COVID disease itself can be very, very hard and can make you very, very sick and have you know clot, problems with clotting and fatigue and, you know, and it could make you very, very sick. And, you know, basically you could die from it. And so even if you did have symptoms from the vaccine itself, including clotting symptoms or headaches, you know, muscle aches, it's less severe than if you actually had the COVID. And it's actually not as common as if you have the COVID um, infection. So it's all a matter of balance, I would say, you know, um, it's uh, kind of the pros and cons, but we'll go into more detail of that um, later. But yeah, but please uh, post your concerns and the questions that your clients have, and hopefully we can find a way to uh, help you address that. Um, Yeah. Yeah, that was my question. Um, can you show us, uh, can you tell us an example how to be more tactful to the family when they keep on saying, we'd like to come and visit. So both that family and my client are not, both of them are not vaccinated. So I just keep on saying that, you know, what the, uh, um, Department of Health is saying is we are okay to uh, admit visitors if both parties are vaccinated, like, I mean, the client and the visitor, but later on again, they keep on texting me, can we come and pick up my mom and bring her to the church? So um, can you tell us in more tactful way how to deal with a family like that, doctor? Well, I guess, I don't know, what, what, have, have people faced that challenge? What are you guys see, seeing? And are you able to uh, give an answer? You know, I haven't been letting my families either come into the house yet. They still can visit outside, still at a six foot distance, utilizing their mask and their face shields. Also, I don't let the families take them out yet. I tell them that the vaccine is not 100%. Because our aging, our age population so vulnerable, I don't let them go out into the general public with their families. But that's just what my rule is and everybody can make their own decision. I just, I'm not only afraid of that one resident going out, I'm what, afraid that that was resident coming home is going to infect everyone else. 
Right. And I think that is the key that you need to talk about. It, you know, that's, you know, for you, but for me, I, you know, I'm the owner of this place and I have other people who live here. I cannot put everybody here at risk. Right. So, um, yeah. So yeah. outside visits, six feet apart, you know, uh, people be very, you know, be very creative. You know, you do your iPad visits or you sit outside and you have a barrier, you know, a plastic barrier outside or you're at a table that's, you know, distance uh, apart and doing the visits outside would probably be the safest if they insist on visiting. And, and the thing is, a um, supervised visit too, because then you know, I mean, because at home, you don't know what they did, right? Um, but if they're even outside visit at your facility, um, they should be supervised so that you know that they didn't actually go and give them the hug. So thank you. I don't, I wouldn't say forbid the visits entirely, but you have to follow protocols because it's for the safety of everybody else in the house. Zoom. Yeah. Anybody else have ideas? Oh, let's see. Again, a 46 year old female with underlying heart problem was positive and survives. Does they need to get vaccinated right away without worrying about the vaccine side effects? Okay, well, that's a vaccine question. But yeah, so I think that. Uh, if you have underlying heart problem already got positive, that's that's fantastic that they survived. I'm really happy for them. But I think the idea that people who were positive uh, can should recommend to still get the vaccine uh, so that it will actually boost the system more so that the next time they get, encounter the virus, they will fight it off even harder. So I think it's a good thing. I don't think they have to, I mean, it's probably they are boosted already. So maybe they won't have, it's very hard to say who's going to have side effects and who's not going to have side effects. Everybody's an individual. There's some people who don't get much side effects, but they have just as good immune response. So hard to say, but I would recommend people who even were infected to get the vaccine. Okay. Yeah. Oh, and so if the client missed the second dose, can he still get it somewhere? Yeah, I would say even if it's, look, it's now April, right? It's from um, January, four months later. I don't think that's, I mean, ideally you would get it within three to four weeks, but if it's later, I mean, it's still better than not. It's a booster shot. Okay, can we address um, the one that says, shall case managers still be wearing a mask around patient even though they are vaccinated? Can you address that question, please? Oh yeah. So yeah, vaccination doesn't um, protect you completely. It just boosts your immune system so that when you recognize the, um, the virus uh, later on, you can fight it faster. It doesn't mean you won't get infected. It doesn't mean you won't pass it on. So it's important to, even if you have the vaccination, to always, we're still to wear a mask to prevent it from spreading. I mean, Hello. less chance, but still need to wear a mask even after vaccination. Um, Hi, can anyone hear me? Yes. So, um... One day, one of the case managers came over and she needed to take one of her clients to do blood work. Oh. And as soon as our patient, you know, had oh. went in the car, she had told him that, oh, you don't have to wear your mask around me. And I was like, no, he has to wear his mask at all times when he's around people. And she's like, mm -hmm. oh, no, we're vaccinated. We're covered. And I honestly felt very scared because if she's telling all these other patients from you know the health clinic that she, they don't have to wear a mask around her then you know what's that going to be for others because there's other things out there even though we're vaccinated and I'm very highly aware that other people still can get it even though we're vaccinated yeah, you have a right to be concerned. That's that that person should do some uh, 
education and training, just like everybody here, right? So you can go. Right. <laughs> all the case so, managers that come into your house. <laughs> and it's like, no, 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 no. We still have to wear our mask around our patients, even though we're vaccinated. And please do not tell him he doesn't have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I know there's so, so many one questions one here. One. So please uh, let me know if I've like missed any here. I was wondering if there was like an email that we could send to these health clinics so everybody is on the same page versus, you know, case managers telling their clients or patients that they don't have to wear their mask around them. I'm like, what? Yeah. And then they start to think, you know, patients start to think, oh, we don't need to wear a mask. It's like, no, 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 no. You have to wear your mask. Yeah. So yeah. So, yeah, I don't know. I guess that person has a boss. Maybe the boss needs to be aware of this. Okay. Oh, but. I'll, I'll go ahead and talk to her boss. <laughs> Thank yeah. you so much. Yeah. Okay. We have, yeah, other questions or concerns about COVID symptoms, testing, care home scenarios. PPE. Okay. And you know, and if you're thinking about it, you know, um, and you have questions, when you register for the next session, there's a box that you could put in question, the where you can put questions. Just put in all your questions there. And we're gonna collect, actually, so Michaela or John, you know, collect everything at the questions in the chat box here. And we're going to take a look at them and we're going to take a look at any of the questions you put in when you register and we'll try to find all the answers for you so that when we chat next time when we come back together next month and we'll try to you know address the questions that you came with and so that way um, we could help you out and dr Wen, i think that's a good uh, point to also uh, indicate that people will need to register for each session individually. Uh, it's not a group registration. Hmm. Yeah. Right. As far as uh, for each each session, right? Right. Yeah. So if you want to get credit for today's session, you got to register for this one. And next month, if you want to get credit for that one, you got to register for that one. Okay. So each time. Okay. Any questions? All right. With that, I think I'm just going to say thanks for coming and uh, make sure you fill out that um, evaluation.